Hello, Gary. Hey, Guy. How are you? I'm all right. So this is our first first time we got these someone else from the same band. It is. You know it I mean? is really, yeah. Because we had Roland Orzabal on a few months ago, and uh, we sort of dug deep into Tears for Fears' past from his point of view, and. Actually, this is quite an interesting band, isn't it, really? Because there's only two points of view <laughs> and we're going to do the other one. Uh, that's true. I mean, yeah. I mean, well, that's interesting because I, I don't think bands necessarily sort of have four or five different points of view, do they? There's usually one or two actual points of view. <laughs> and everyone else just sort of tags <laughs> along. Yeah, whatever he said. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But also, uh, they've got a, a new album coming out in February. I think, it's fe- yes. I think it's February. And he's actually made a couple of really nice albums on his own. He has. Delved into a bit of acting. He's done a couple yeah. of TED Talks, I saw. Yeah. But, you know, I think we're going to be talking a lot about this new project, which um, you know, we've heard, we've had the privilege of hearing, and it sounds really good. Yes, it does. Yes, and also, but they, the, the fact that they are that rarest of thing, a band who managed to sort of resolve with a happy ending. So, yeah, yeah, you know, but they have their really difficult times, don't they? And they do come back together. Yeah. They fight, fight, and, fight, fight, fight. You know, I, I, I remember <laughs> Roland saying when we interviewed him that the place they don't get on is on the road. Yeah, a bit like you and me, really. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> you know I'm the top dog, right? Yes. <laughs> I'm on the top bunk. You certainly let me know it. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. This was great, guys. I, I, it's so great to talk to two guys that have done this. That's well, a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. You know, what people forget about Bowie is that he was such a kind man. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London, they're brilliant. I know you're musicians, but you've been more professional than a lot of journalists. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. To, to get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Hello, Kurt. How are you? Hey, Gary. Hey, Guy. Nice looking bookshelf. Oh, yes. It's, uh, well, you know, this is where I do the Zoom calls. It's, you know. Oh, so that's just a backdrop. You haven't actually got any books at all. <laughs> no, this is this is the backdrop from Zoom. Yeah. How, how are you? Are you in LA? I am in LA, yeah. That's where you live, right? Yeah, I've been here for, oh, God. Yes, my eldest is 22. So I've been here for 23 years now. You're naturalised, aren't you? You've gone the whole hog. I am an American citizen. I became, well, both me and Frances, my wife, who's actually also, well, she's Welsh, but British, even though we met in New York, we both became naturalised so we could both vote for Obama the first time he got elected. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a noble reason for citizenship. Well, we've been paying taxes forever. I mean, I've lived here for 30, what, yeah. 33 years or so now. So I've lived here more than half my life and we pay taxes, but we never got to vote because we never became citizens. So um, we were so you know, annoyed with the whole George Bush era, even though looking back on it, you wish he was back. Extraordinary, isn't it? You look back yeah. and I know, because at the time that was the end of the world. I mean, it yeah. was, yeah. yeah. But now yeah. you look back on it with nostalgia. <laughs> you know, and King God. Listen, we don't want to split our audiences right at the very beginning of this entire podcast. Con- <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> on what is a great album. Yes. We've had the privilege very, of hearing nice it. Album. And, uh, you know, just uh, sounds totally like a Tears for Fears album should do, but maturer, wiser. And, uh, you know, it's just nice to hear some of that clever music back out there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it took a while. I mean, I think we were struggling for direction for a while. At the behest of our, our old management, we were writing with sort of very modern songwriters and uh, he was trying to bring us into the modern era, I think. And I don't think it was a bad thing necessarily. I I think that was part of the process of us getting to where the album ended up. Can I just, because this is the way a lot of artists work now. In fact, all artists work like this. You know, we're almost back to that sort of 19, late 50s, early 60s, Tim Pan Alley where, oh, you know, artists can't be trusted with a song. You know, they'll get themselves on the publishing because they sat in the room or because they insisted on being on the publishing, but they can't be trusted. It's got to be down to guys who aren't celebrities, who aren't performers, sometimes aren't even singers in a room and everyone's falling into that now you know Coldplay just made a whole album with Max Martin I mean surely by now those guys can write their own album but but, was you frustrated by that yeah Um, because it's not like you're not proven 
you know, songwriters? Or, no, was it, or was this for you? I, I don't know. Like I say, I think that going through that process led us to where we ended up, with, which is a good thing. So, so there is a positive to take from it. Clearly, it wasn't for us. <laughs> I mean, you know, that became apparent when we listened back to all these tracks and we're like, no, it, it's not a Tears for Fears record. It's us trying to be modern and, and write, you know, a modern hit. It's never been our comfort zone to do whatever's current. I mean, I, th- I think our, our comfort zone is to really be more experimental and to do things that maybe entertain us and, you know, and that we get something more from. So, like I say, the, the process led us to where we ended up, but um, I don't want to go through it again. Yeah, I, the, the sort of blueprint really is kind of an A&R ideal at the moment, isn't it? It's, you know, it's the, the, that's the only sort of thing they know. It's like, if I'm going to control this, you've got to go to these certain songwriters. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I even, you know, even with, you know, Elton's new work, you know, I mean, he's done it a different way, which is let me bring in all the young people and sing with them, you know, and that's fine. And I'm, I'm not knocking Elton for that because you may sit back and think that he doesn't know who all these people are necessarily and he doesn't keep up with modern music, but knowing Elton, he actually does. Mm-hmm. So he actually is a fan of theirs, probably. Yeah, yeah. So and it's, it's quite genuine because he actually is a huge music fan. But, you know, I, I don't know. There was a certain dishonesty about it, I think. Sorry, because no, I was just going to say, because what's lovely about the album is it's like a, a comfy pair of slippers. It's like, oh, it's Tears for Fears. It's that thing. And it's that thing that we love and we know. And, and so it's, I'm trying to think what you would be wanting to add but to that. But also, Guy, not in the way that I can imagine it being like. Ironically, they, the record company says, you've got to go and see that songwriter. He's going to make you a modern band. And you get there, I'm assuming, Kurt. And what you hear is them trying to sound like you in the 80s. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is very true. We would go into these sessions and, and there would be whatever version of everybody wants to rule the world or shout or, you know, they're basically referencing us. So yeah. you're going into a writing session where someone's referencing you and surely we are the best at referencing us. <laughs> so it, it was <laughs> it was kind of a weird thing. But like I say, it did if you don't know what direction you're going in musically, and I think we weren't sure at that point in time, it did help us. It, it pushed us to actually be more confident within ourselves to do it ourselves. We knew at the end of it that this wasn't for us. But there's also, there's a lovely thing with your songs, as can be seen from that fabulous reinvention of Mad World. And you did that version with your daughter, which was absolutely yeah. gorgeous. But it's that lovely thing of how, if you strip everything away, the songs underneath are brilliant and pure and strong. And that's, you know, and then you have that kind of sort of icing of the Tears for Fears thing on top. So, And I think that was the issue. I didn't think by the end of all these writing sessions, I actually didn't think the songs were that strong. They didn't have enough meaning for me. You know, I I don't want to say message because that sounds so trite but um you know they just really didn't mean much it was just sort of not vacuous pop songs they were good pop songs but they didn't say anything to me and obviously we wouldn't be so tabloid as to ask for any names <laughs> <No. right? laughs> you, you know i think what it is is when you those guys in writing rooms tend to be programmers they start all their songs mostly with the music from reading this, the small bit that I did about this album and, and th- looking at No Small Things, the opening track on the album, what you guys would are best at is mining songs from your soul, sometimes from your very dark soul, individually. Yeah. And to just pick up the acoustic guitar, which is how the album starts, and to try and find the truth in you both together in a room, then you knew what the album was going to be about, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that we basically went the complete opposite route after doing all those sessions. We knew we didn't really like the album as a whole because we we had finished an album effectively. But we ended up keeping five songs and reworking them a little bit and then recording a half of what is now the album from fresh. And um, we sat down, as you say, in my house here in L.A., with two acoustic guitars and and decided, okay, let's see where this leads us. And it led us to this 
place where we are comfortable, which is experimentation, doing things a bit different. And it does start off as an acoustic kind of in the vein of Johnny Cash, you may say, or it kind of sounds a bit like a country song, but it then progresses into something that's far grander. And I think that's where we feel comfortable. I think it was just enjoying ourselves more than anything else. That song, No Small Thing, was just a joy from start to finish to make and record. I think that's where we enjoy it the most, is if we're trying to do something that's slightly different and we're trying to push ourselves into doing something that's big and bold and, I mean, some would say a little grandiose at times, but I think that's where we're comfortable. Mm -hmm. What's the division of labour? What do you tend to play in the studio? Well, it depends. I mean, we all play kind of everything. You know, I'm normally the one sitting at the back going, that's good or that's crap. You know, but, you know, I mean... That's a good job. Yeah, Everyone wants that yeah, job. <laughs> I play, you know, bass, obviously, keyboards. We yeah, all play keyboards. I mean, guitar I'm really is not my forte at all. I mean, a six-string. Give me a four-string, I'm fine. Six strings, I'm pretty Guy's definitely at. winning in, in the 60-odd episodes that we've done of this podcast. He has had more bass players on this show <laughs> than I've had guitar players. <laughs> I don't know what that says about the openness. That could sound very, very different yeah, from what I think you it, want it to sound it like. It says something about the openness <laughs> and keenness of bass players to come and talk. Yeah, Bass players actually have the clearest picture of the whole thing because they have such a supportive role. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's... Come on, go with this, Kurt, go with it. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, the bass player and the drummer are the ones that keep the shit together, basically. You know, I mean, that's their job. It comes down to feel. So when I say facetiously, I'm the one in the background going, that's crap, that's great. Mm. That's just feel. I mean, that's all it is. And if you're in a rhythm section, which is not be bass and drums, as we know, you go by feel, you know, and sometimes a feel is different to a picture. Oh, that's nice. Well, like well that. studio where like Roland and Chom can go down this rabbit hole of it's not quite exactly in time. They're seeing the picture. They're seeing a screen. Whereas I may sit at the back going, I want it out of time. It feels wrong. So it, it's a feel. Um, so I think that's more my job. If there is one, is really trying to capture that feeling. Yeah, I mean, I don't this, I don't mean this offensively. I don't see you as a bass player. I see you as a sort of, and now I do say, this is going to sound brilliantly pretentious. I see you as like a <laughs> pair of architects making this music. Or if it's art, then you're like Gilbert and George. You know, there's there's... What's difficult for the listener is knowing, you know, where you start and he begins, as it were. You know, when you're writing that opening song in the same room together, whose heart is it coming out of? Or do you sympathise with each other so much now? Or empathise, I should say. Yeah, well, empathy, yeah, empathy is a better word. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think we ever really question it. Because when it's happening, and we don't really analyse it, but when it's happening, we both know. So, for instance, with No Small Thing, we both knew this was good. This is the sort of thing that's going to bring this album together. And when Roland went back to England and kind of started writing a song around the thing we were playing, he was kind of nervous about sending it to me because it was so different. And, of course, as soon as he had sent it to me, I was like, well, different is great. Um, so, yeah, this is where we should be going. Yeah. So once we're on the same page... Yeah, but but again, nothing that we really sit down and think about. Um, it's just that we kind of know when we're getting somewhere. How, how do you mm. stop the album sounding like two solo albums competing when you're because you're both both very distinct songwriters now as well? And I know that you know we had Roland on a while ago, and he he said that he felt that he screwed up a bit in Seeds of Love because he dominated a lot of the writing process in that. How does the dance work? Um, who knows, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, I think with, with Seeds of Love, that was a kind of difficult period. And I do love some of the tracks on, on that album. I'm not a fan of 100% of it. But then, you know, Roland was dominating most of the songwriting and recording process at that point in time. But I don't necessarily think that was 100% his fault either. I mean, I went through a marriage divorce at the time. I'd met my then now wife, who we've been together for, you know, well over 30 years in New York. So I was going back to New York and coming back to England, and I was trying to sort my personal life out. So I don't, you know, 100% blame him for it. I was choosing to be absent at times too. But that's when I got to the point where I decided to leave and, and try and basically sort myself out. I wasn't really comfortable where I was in life at that point in time. 
But, um, you know, nowadays, I think we have a far greater appreciation of our strengths. So, you know, as you say, it's a difficult process because we're both very strong-willed and we're both singers, which makes it even more complicated. Nightmare. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, just the fact that you have, you know, a lead singer has to have a certain amount of ego. There's no question about that. I'm sure you've been through that. We had one singer in Spandau Valley. That was enough, <laughs> I think, you know. <laughs> if you can imagine two of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no one else. <laughs> yeah, and no one else. Really. Then, it, yeah, it can get to the point where you butt heads now and again. But that's okay. I mean, what, I think what's different now is it's okay for us to butt heads now and again. It's okay for us to disagree about things. And if we get a meeting of the minds, as we did eventually on this album, then it's wonderful. But we're also old enough and wise enough to know that if it's not for one of us, which was happening with the previous version of, you know, the initial writing sessions. And, and to be honest, Rowan was enjoying those. And he actually kind of liked the songs back then. I mean, he came to dislike them, but he was into it. And that was the point where I was in a position where I just said, look, if this is what you want to do, then I can't be a part of it because I don't like it. Oh, so it nearly never happened. <laughs> it nearly never happened. Well, because it's, and it's not, you know, because I, I've said this in a few interviews already and it's not, it wasn't me stamping my feet. It was me saying, look, if this is what you want to do, then, you know, go ahead and do it. But it's really not for me. I, I, I just don't feel it. And um, I mean, that's when I wrote the song Stay, which is on the album, which was basically about me deciding to stay or not stay. Wow. Um, which is exactly what um, Should I Stay or Should I Go is, isn't it? By yeah, the Clash. It's exactly. exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's just the same emotion. Yeah. And that became part of the album. So that was a while ago because that, that song was on your Greatest Hits album a while yeah, ago, well, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 So that was quite a while ago. When the Greatest Hits thing came out, that was part of the recording process. And weirdly, Stay and probably two other songs were the only ones I really liked at that point. It's a great song. And Rowan was liking all the kind of up-tempo. He felt like he, we were making a club record. And my answer to that was, no one wants to see 60-year-olds make a club record. <laughs> and yeah. I couldn't be a part of that. But... Um, he ended up going away and then spending time with the music and, and, and realizing that it wasn't right as well, which is great. So we, we ended up at the same point and then we started afresh and it was actually kind of easy and quite liberating to just do what you feel, what feels good to you. You have this relationship which just goes on forever and ever and it's been through every possible up and down, right? I mean, you've done the whole book, you've run the whole gamut and you're here working together still. It must actually be a really lovely place to be. Yeah, I mean, it, it feels good when it's working. You know, I mean, the, the only caveat I would introduce would be, you know, I think the difference is now that if it does fall apart again, we're comfortable with that. I, I think we're less precious now. Do you do get feel nervous sending your songs to Roland? That's not to, to undermine you. I mean, we all feel nervous sending a sh song or showing a song to someone. Because your songs, are, they're very personal on here as well, so... Yeah. No, not really. I mean, the thing is, you get to a point where um, you just think, well, this is what I feel is good. And, you know, you send it off. And that's what I'm saying about being kind of a little more comfortable with it and less precious is if your partner doesn't like it, then there's two choices, right? A, you don't use it and you have to be OK with that. Or B, if we're not on the same page clearly, then you walk away from it. So yeah. they're, they're kind of simple choices. Now, I know. think there's a sense of equanimity on the record that you've not maybe had before. Yeah, I, I think this is the most tears record we've done when I say, you know, as a partnership since the hurting in Songs in the Big Chair. I think this is the most where we have both poured in a lot of time and effort to make this record and both like it. How did you find the process different when you were making your solo records, especially um, ah halfway halfway, halfway pleased. pleased, yeah, yeah, which is a lovely record. Yeah, I, I mean, I love doing those, you know, but they're not done for any commercial reason. They're done purely to get something out of your system, you know. I mean, I'm mm. I'm aware that the commercial side of 
of what I do is really me and Roland. I mean, that's just what it is. Making records on our own is really us going off and not caring about commerciality and not, you know, just going off and making a record for ourselves, which is a joy. I think we all, you know, should go and do that because I think it's, you get back to the whole reason you started to make music, which was, you know, you feel like you, you want to say something. As you say, they're very personal records. They were never intended to be commercial in any way, shape or form. But there's a certain freedom in that. I think that both of us need to do that now and again. It's about being alive, isn't it? I mean, you know, you're a musician, you know. You're not... yeah. I watched a bit of, well, I watched one of your TED Talks, actually. I know you've done a couple. I think you've only, you've done two. Yeah. Um, and I get the sense from you that there are some things that frustrate you. You know, one is this idea of celebrity and do people really know who I am? And it, make, it, it did make me think a little bit more about this because obviously, you know, we suffer this sometimes, you know, people meet you and go, you're not how I expected you to be, you know, and uh, and, and then you realise there's just this sort of thin image out there yeah. of us all. But the, what we've done is we've sort of written our own play and we've written our own characters and we're forever forced to be those characters. Is, is there a sense with you that you're, that still frustrates you or are you still now stepping back into, you know, Kurt Smith, here I am, Tears for Fears man? Yeah, I've never been comfortable with it. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was, you know, the whole reason why I left Tears for Fears for that period of time was we would got so big and became kind of famous. And and I'm not, you know, for someone who's a, a singer and performer, I'm not that I'm really not that comfortable with it. And and I'm not that confident about it. So there's this sort of battle that goes on in me, which I think is actually very healthy, a healthy level of self hatred, <laughs> you know, where where you just don't think you're good enough, and mm. I think that's a good thing because if, if you become well known, because you can never get too big for your boots, if you see what I'm saying. So, so that's when I stepped away from it. When I did the the sort of TED talks, yeah, it was more about the one advantage of social media now is people can get to know you. Because you're you're actually talking to them directly. I'm mm -hmm. not going through a record company. I'm not being interviewed. I'm saying what I want to say, basically. So that taking down that barrier of, you know, we're the audience. That's the artist, and there's this barrier between them. When they sort of come into your personal world, so you know, see you with your kids, see you walking your dogs, whatever it may be. That's everyday life. So suddenly they get to enter your everyday life and then you don't become that sort of idol. You, you become an actual person. And I think that was what I was getting at with those talks was the one positive thing. And I think it's the only one positive thing about social media right. is that it makes us more normal. Do you know what? I've just had an incredibly random memory from you saying that, which is that <laughs> But I was at a Peter Gabriel gig at Crystal, was it Crystal Palace in 1983? And I was in this band Ice House and we had a hit at the time and you were there, you were in the audience. And you're saying, and I, I thought, oh, I'm going to go and say, that's Kurt Smith from Tears for Fears. I'm, gonna, I'm in a band, I'll go and say hello to him. And I remember, and I remember walked up and you were, I remember you had a long bit of hair at the back then. Yeah, and, I think that's called a cue. And you seemed incredibly self-conscious. And I just had this feeling that it really wouldn't be cool to come and talk to you. So I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> not in a bad way, not in a bad, but you, it just seemed like it would be uncomfortable for you. It's a great well, game. No. Yeah, I, I, um, yeah, you're probably right. You know, I mean, I think that was just after we'd become sort of a big band, especially with the hurt. Yeah. After the hurting, so it was 1983, after the hurting, it, our audience were then, weirdly, you know, primarily young girls, you know, which was strange. And, and I found that particularly weird, you know. I, here's the sort of thing that I was never comfortable with, was people screaming like you were, you know, you were God or whatever, and yet I'm sitting there going, you don't even know me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've always found that weird. I've always found it weird that anyone could look to you for answers, could look to you as an idol or whatever, yet they don't know you. I think what makes people scream or, you know, as far even boys shout, and it's, 
it's the f sort of fake power that being a rock star assumes. And that's a very powerful thing to watch. And you can either sort of, you know, ignore it and poo-poo it, or you just, you, you go with it, you know, like we're messiahs, you know, it's... But the thing you've got to remember, right, from the point of view of the fact of how uncomfortable that can be, you've got to remember, and exactly how we were when we were kids, the fact that obviously what you were doing for people, Kurt, in the same way as like Bowie did for us and Townsend or whatever and other people, is that you're the people who have got the words that I want to hear, that explain my life to me, that make me feel not alone. So it's nothing to do with knowing you. You're already saying the stuff, you know? No, I think you're right. And I think that... Um... I'm fine with people, you know, looking up to you in the sense that you're saying the things they want to say, but looking up to you as someone who is bigger or better than them, that's where I get, you know. Then you're asking for a mature response to something from teenagers, which <laughs> yeah, is another well, thing story, altogether. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I felt the same way when I, you know, first met Peter Gabriel or when I first met Bowie, or, you know, I felt the same way. You know, and then sure. you realize, oh, yeah. my God, they're just normal people. I mean, with McCartney, with mm -hmm. Elton. I mean, these are people that I idolized when I was younger. I was disappointed when they, you find it. Sometimes you're disappointed. I remember meeting Bowie and, think, and I mean, thinking, luckily, oh, God. I, luckily, I'm naming the ones that I wasn't disappointed. With. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, very Peter, good. Very good. Peter like Elton, <laughs> you know, yeah. Bowie, McCartney were all, you know, quite genuinely nice. But here's the irony, though, Kurt, because... When we spoke to Roland, he said, the thing is, when we did The Hurting, at the end of that, Kurt was a pop star, fully formed pop star, and I wasn't. And yet, little did he know, actually. Yeah, he probably, he was no, suffering I don't think too. he ever knew that I wasn't comfortable with that, particularly. You know, you fall into it and... It kind of brings you no comfort. It brings you no relief. I mean, it just doesn't. So you, you, you were obviously, I mean, were you appearing comfortable? Like I say, you didn't appear comfortable with it to me when I saw you. But it, so, I mean, to Roland, did he think you were just, you know, you had this thing down and you loved it? But, you know, therein lies the issue of having two front men. You know, if the other fr one other front man is getting more attention, it's annoying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, this is what made you so interesting. You know, you weren't wham. You were making sensitive music, music that was about subject matters that, you know, no one had ever touched upon before and was truly, you know, dark and devastating and personal, you know, and needed to be out there. You were very different. You weren't the same as a lot of those other pop stars that were around at the time. And I think that must have been a struggle for you. Although, you know, you went on and made the big chair, which was just <laughs> yeah. ridiculously brilliant. Um, I mean, that, that was the weird thing about us, I guess, is that we became sort of these kind of teen idols on the hurting, yet the subject matter really wasn't that, you know, it, it wasn't <laughs> vacuous and it wasn't saying nothing. So there's that weird, I mean, that's the balance we have to try and get where, you know, you can still be commercial to some degree, but still be saying something. And that's not an easy thing to do at times. Yeah, but then, I mean, the, the thing with Songs from the Big Chair is that for matter what you were saying, it was just wrapped up in these just absolutely irresistible pop masterpieces production was it's yeah, phenomenal yeah. <laughs> i mean still it's still and i listen to it it's still just god no it still sounds gorgeous. good now and yeah. the hurting sounds a little twee now but i think that's what led us to songs in the big chair because when we did the hurting we were overly precious about every single thing that went on because we were young I mean, most of our time was spent arguing with Chris Hughes and Ross Cullum and Dave Bates, our a &R guy, um, oh. in the studio. You know, what made us the band then was me and Roland definitely being together as a unit, fighting against what we considered to be the business, which is the producer and the record company. We fought a lot to get that album sounding the way it was. And then, you know, in retrospect, we realised we were a little too precious about it. And that, that there was nothing wrong with being bigger and bolder. And I think that's what we learned between The Hurting and Songs of the Big Chair was on Songs of the Big Chair, we weren't shy about being bold and about being big. And all those things we kind of walked away from on The Hurting, putting on bigger guitar sounds, putting on making a song sound kind of huge, putting on bombastic drums, all those things that we shied away from on The Hurting, we embraced on songs in the big chair. 
you know, I, in a way, as far as a live band is concerned, you're kind of late bloomers, and we will we'll get yeah. into that. In that, you know, <laughs> really, your success as a live band has come so late, and it's been an extraordinary thing to happen because normally, you know, this is what happens to bands at the beginning of their career. But you know, Roland said that you know you felt you suffered as a live band in those early days, and one of the reasons you you're glad you never did Live Aid, and was you just couldn't produce that music in the way you'd like to on stage. Are we going to find out that you've got a completely different take on this? Yeah. We, um, yeah. I mean, no, no I, I, no, I actually, you know, on this occasion, agree with my partner. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, we weren't that great. We just weren't, I think. That's incredibly ballsy, to, you know, to, especially with the, the success you've got when you're young and seen as a god, to kind of get up on a stage and actually go, yeah, actually, we're not all that. That's it's, because they're perfectionists. quite extraordinarily self-aware. Here in, you know, again, going back to the uh, healthy dose of self-hatred, you know, I still come off stage nowadays going, eh, <laughs> you know, I mean, if it's not that great, you just do. And there are times, it's interesting if you're a musician, because there are times where the audience go absolutely berserk, right? So it's a great audience and you can walk off stage and go, we really weren't that good tonight. And there are times where the audience are not that good but you play incredibly well and you're left with a far greater feeling than that show that went down better. If you mm -hmm. It's just, a, it's a musician thing where, you know, you pick apart the strengths and the weaknesses of a performance. And especially weirdly as a bass player, going back to that, you know, there are shows where myself and Jamie, our drummer now, Jamie Wallen, are just so in tune that those are the shows that are great, you know, for me. It's when I walk up, like, we were in tune tonight. That was fantastic. And it doesn't matter what the audience was doing, to be honest. And you know what? And I'll, I'll guarantee you that those are the nights that the rest of the band is flying as well. No, without question. Because yeah. if you're happening, you know, if you're happening, everyone's yeah. happening. But um, yeah. so, yeah, I, I've always been, and I think we both have always been very harsh critics of our own work. Yeah, I, I, you know, I get that from both of you, that, you know, you're, you're total perfectionists. You can hear it in your productions and, and everything you do. You know, you're very, very thoughtful. But there's the element, touch of the Beatles here, isn't there? Is it of, of, you know, the way it was like, God, the screaming drove us mad. You know, well, let's go in and make some music that you can only make in studios and yeah. maybe could never produce live. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I think we've got better at producing those things live now. Technology has made it. A technology lot helps. Yeah. You know, modern technology yeah. really helps in a big way. I mean, you know, we were going out. I mean, on the on the Seeds of Love tour, we went on the road with two Fairlights. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were taking a couple hundred Guy, thousand did he say worth of two gear. fellas. Fairlight. Oh, Fairlight. Fairlight. Yeah. For our listeners who don't know, the Fairlight was the original sampling synthesizer. It cost yeah. as much as a house and was about as big as one. And you could yeah, sample so about two seconds. <laughs> so they were yeah. like a hundred thousand pounds each, right? So yeah. two hundred thousand pounds worth of machinery to go out and perform this live, which we can now do far better with just a laptop. With a phone. With a laptop. <laughs> Not with a phone. Yeah, actually, to be honest, I have a Fairlight app on my phone. In fact. <laughs> Do you know what? Funny, I, I was at Nam a couple of years ago, and Fairlight did this big relaunch, and and they had the all the famous samples. They had like the Kate Bush's sample, all, all the samples that, yeah. which is basically the orchestra stab. Rank, that's the Fairlight, right? That's a yeah. hundred grand right there. Rank, or the ranks. or the, uh, yeah. the Peter Gabriel flutes, those ones. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But it had a slot at the end of the keyboard that you could put your phone in. And the irony was that the phone could do everything that this huge yeah. Yeah. box could yeah. do. That is the joy of modern technology, that it's easier to produce live now. And also the musicians we play with now are just better musicians. You know, you realise after a while that the... the wow, the, hang on, you had the poshest musicians in the world back then. <laughs> um, well, live, I, I mean, I... Oh, live, maybe not. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> no, I mean, we didn't use all those people live. Phil Collins never played drums with us live, you know, but, um, <laughs> or, or did, nor did Manu Kache. But I think that playing with better musicians which i believe they are now pushes you so it makes you better also mm -hmm. um, i think you know i think i'm, I'm a, i can say these things now to you about your troubles with with roland and uh, between uh -oh. you no because because obviously the story has evolved and gone and 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 these guys are you know evolved humans and have come together 
in a way that with this album, as I said earlier, which has got real equanimity about it. But he was saying to us before that, you know, and he's very conscious of this, that, that on that first album you sang all the hits and then as the records went on, you know, you sang less and less and to the Seeds of Love you weren't performing and that must have been a very tough period for you, not feeling you had your foot in the door enough or were you letting that happen? I mean, it was. Um, yeah, like I say, I think with, with, yeah, with Seeds of Love, I definitely let it happen. Again, going back to, you know, what I said earlier about going through a divorce at that point in time. You know, I was married in England and then having to go through that and meet my now wife in New York. But was it about building your songwriting chops? Was that also part of what you needed to do? I th- Well, I just think I needed to get away. Um, you know, which I did. I, I mean, I needed to get out of that zone of being the, f- especially being in Bath, right? So Bath being my hometown, you know, you're the most famous person ever born there, basically. So you can't do anything there without everyone knowing about it. Yeah. Whether it was conscious or not, whether I consciously walked away, I didn't think of it on, you know, that deeply as you're suggesting, Gary, but I think I just needed to step away from it and I needed something fresh. And and New York was the ideal place for me at that point in time because no one cares who you are in New York. No one. No one's going to bat an eyelid. No one's going to pay attention. Even if they recognize you, New Yorkers don't come up and talk to you. They just don't. Yeah, yeah. So you can disappear and feel just like a regular person. And that was very important for me. And then initially I really didn't, sort of I stayed involved in music but I wasn't writing um I had a radio show I did some MTV presenting and then I met this guy Charlton Pettis oh yeah yeah and in New York and we started writing together he was like no come on you're a singer come on you gotta write you can't just not do this and so he convinced me to start writing again which I did and then then we formed this little band and we played these little clubs in New York and suddenly I got the whole ah this is what I do this is what I enjoy the most that's when you got into a residency thing well it was it wasn't I mean it was kind of a residency but it wasn't one place we had a band we can name the band Mayfield I didn't tell any you know on the posters or anything it (laughs) never said for Kurt Smith it never never said my name it just said the name of the band but isn't that the pun is Kurt is Mayfield isn't it exactly (laughs) that was the very bad pun the decision was I'm only going to play places I can walk (laughs) so we played every club within walking distance of my apartment in Soho. So there was, you know, there was the Mercury Lounges on Houston, um, Brownies, which is on a, over an avenue way, CBGBs even back then on the Bowery. There's no longer there, unfortunately. Um, the bottom line, all places that I could walk to. And we did that for kind of on and off for like a year. And it was fantastic. Probably the most fun I've had playing music. Well, certainly at that point in time, it was the most fun I'd had playing music since I was, you know, in my teen years. And then what did you do? Then did you have to move to find a new set of bars to play? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, you know, but I think the testament to all of the strength of that is that Charlton is still with us. And the keyboard player in Maple was Doug Petty and Doug is still playing with tears. So these are all the mm-hmm. connections I made in New York. It sounds like a Paul Oster novel. <laughs> <laughs> really, but, but, but in a way, you know, and I get what you're doing. You felt you needed to pay your dues. Yeah. You felt you needed to do that stuff that, you know, in the old days people did before they got their record contract. Yeah. But, you know, being who we, you know, as we always got signed as kids, you know, we, you never got the chance to do. No, and I think, you know, and I think a lot of that made me a better player too. But also there was a a joy in New York, which I never really got in England, where every musician in New York is really supportive of other musicians, Mm -hmm. which I never felt was the case necessarily in England, I don't think, you know, for whatever reason. But um, there was like this sort of music collective and we had a studio, you know, when I was recording with Chart back then, we had a studio in, in Dumbo in Brooklyn, the other side of the river. And it was a basement of this big industrial building and there were all there was down there was music studios. Everyone was a musician renting these little places. And, you know, you become friends with them. And then if, you know, we needed some weird guitar on one thing, there was Kenny who had this other band who was in the next studio. We'd get him in to come play. So it was very much this sort of music collective, which I just loved, you know, and it really Mm. rekindled my passion for music 
Was Roland ever on your mind during that period? Was it? Did you ever feel like, is he, is he going to call me? Shall I pick up the phone? No, not really. I, I was really, yeah, I was really submerged in that kind of scene where I was thoroughly enjoying it again. So I, I if anything, that would be the last thing on my mind because I didn't want to go back there. It was over. I was really enjoying myself where I was, you know, and those mm. 10 years of living in New York was, you know, one of the happiest periods of my life, that's for sure. So, yeah, it didn't really occur to me. I mean, we, we didn't start talking again until I'd moved to Los Angeles. Was there an actual sort of defining thing? There was a, th- a thing that brought you back together? Yeah, there was or... a, a business. We still, you know, own these buildings together. So we still have business stuff we have to deal with. The Tears for Fears portfolio. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like the portfolio of one one industrial building. I bet it's brutalist as well, isn't it? (laughs) Very, and and in Newcastle. (laughs) Now everyone's going to be off searching for the building in Newcastle that that we own. Um, But so we we had to still deal with with stuff that was ongoing. And I think at one point I had to sign some paperwork. And, you know, in the end, it became easier for us to talk on the phone, I think. So we ended up talking. We haven't spoken to each other in, in nearly 10 years. And um, it seemed fine, you know, other than he would, you know, since then has never stopped talking about how much my accent would change. But you know, <laughs> that's what happens when you move to America, I guess. Obviously, Roland had some real tragedy that went on recently, you know, with his, you know, his wife dying. But it was something you could relate to as well, because in a way it was, it, you know, obviously not in the same way, but she, you'd known her since yeah. you were kids as well. And this was all going to feed into this record to a certain extent. Yeah, without question. I mean, I think that, you know, what we were lacking in the sort of speed dating writing sessions was really heartfelt emotion to me. It wasn't heartfelt emotion because you're working with people that don't know you. So they don't know what you're going through. And I think Caroline's passing was had a big effect on this record, without question. And, and yeah, it had a big effect on me because we'd been friends since we were 13, you know. So, um, mm. you know, it makes you question your own mortality. I mean, I'm sure you go through it as well, where you're finding people your age are dying and we're like, oh, my God, mm. this is strange, you know. And we're we're now the elder statesman because, you know, in my case, my, both my parents passed away quite a while ago and my wife's also. So we're now the sort of elder statesman of the family and, uh, you know, coming mm. to terms with that. You know, Caroline's passing was one thing. I think, you know, the politics that have been happening over the last few years, well, a bunch of years, also fed into it. I mean, you know, all the things that were going on we should have enough subject matter to mine and make something that actually means something. I think that was my frustration, that there was so much going on in the world. And even prior to Caroline's passing politically, you know, climate change, Me Too movement, whatever it may be, there was so much going on that why are we trying to make superficial pop music? I mean, it's just not the time for that. So, you know, I I think that Caroline's passing led us to where we ended up. Because Please Be Happy is one of the main, you know, main tracks that deals with that on the album. It's a phenomenal track. Yeah, I mean, incredibly moving song. And Roland asked me to sing it, which, you know, I obviously felt... Because, you know, I'd known Caroline for so long, I could obviously mine the, the emotion that he put into it. But, I mean, I, whether that was because he couldn't physically sing it, I don't know. I mean, in the sense that... I think it was very painful, too painful for him, you know, and he's still dealing with it now. And it's a horrible thing to watch as a friend. No, I mean, don't you think, Guy, that's a really beautiful thing that, you know, to write a song like that about your wife and what she went through and then uh, to yeah, give to it to the someone, man who yeah, no, that is, you perceive that is as your brother. That is extraordinary. Yeah. It's also, but does mean, because there was this incredible link, you know, because you'd all known each other basically since you were children, was there anyone else? Is there anyone else who's sort of not part of your journey, but who's sort of still around? I mean, this is the thing about social media, isn't it? There's that thing of all those people who you know and you don't, you're not going to call them up, but you can keep them yeah. just sort of there. That's our relationship, Guy, really, isn't it? You sort of is just it? keep me there, Guy, don't you? Just like. <laughs> Feed me little tweets. I think it's slightly different to that. (laughs) But yeah, no, is there anyone else who's come along with you or who's had enough shared experience with both of you who's still there? 
I don't, um, know. I don't know if that's a relevant question, really. I don't know why I'm asking that. Not really. I mean, you know, mm. besides family members, you know, I mean, obviously our family members had lived through all this all the time. But no, I mean, I, I think I left a lot of it behind. And Roland, I think, does have more connections with people in England. And I think it's more difficult for me because I ended up moving to America. So I've been gone from England for, you know, nearly 35 years. But I think this is what people are buying into when they buy your new record. They're buying into the history of the two of you together and this relationship that suffered all the difficulties, the highs and lows that normal life has, normal relationships have, everybody out there. And you become a symbol of how it could work out in the end. But also between the two of you, you know, you've you've had different wives and, and different relationships. The one thing that is constant now is your band. No, without question, I, I think after Caroline passed away, I think that we both realized that we're kind of it, you know, from the old school, if you see what I'm saying. The only person bar, you know, my brothers and in his case, his brothers, bar them, we've had the longest relationship you know, since we were 13 years old. So uh, that's uh, 47 years of knowing each other. <laughs> Guy, do you remember how um, Roland said he first when he first met Kurt, he was scared of him? Yes. As, he, as yes. he should be. Yeah, because I'm wondering what your, how your sort of family background was like, because the house he grew up in sounded extraordinary. Yeah, and he said that you, you came to the door, he was introduced to you by a friend, and you came to the door and you'd been grounded for beating someone up, and he was scared yeah, of Yeah, for you. throwing someone down a flight of stairs, actually. <laughs> we laugh now. Yes. <laughs> I wasn't a very nice child. But having said that... Did he have it coming, though? He did. did he have it he coming? He definitely did. But, um, <laughs> yeah, right. but I think it was... Um, I mean, I grew up on a council estate, you know, albeit in Bath, so hardly, you know, the worst council estate in England. But you end up getting in fights to stop people picking on you. You know, that was a part of growing up on a council estate, I think. So, yeah, my thoughts of Roland, I don't really know. I mean, he seemed, after we met that one time and then I found out about his family background and everything else, it, it seemed, you know, very kind of, yeah, the antithesis of my family, I guess. So what was yours? Well, mine was yeah. completely 100% working class. Yeah. You know, my father was a waiter. My mother worked in boots. That was a lyric right there. It sounded like a Chris Difford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, his mother was, um, you know, I mean, they lived on a council estate as well when he was growing up. But they were theatricals. But they, they? were theatricals. She was theatrical. He, I mean, he was a f- weird French philosopher. You know, I mean, he was batshit crazy. But, um, but, <laughs> wow. uh, but in a, in a, <laughs> to me in a fascinating way you know it was all very different to my upbringing i mean his parents were kind of nuts as mine were but in a very different way you know his his mother was highly intelligent and his father was this kind of wacky french philosopher there was a kindred spirit there was there that somehow that you saw in each other yeah i think so in the in the sense that we felt we always felt there was something wrong you know i think and uh you know both being into music obviously we're both the middle sons of three boys um, we both grew up primarily with our mothers with absent fathers so there was definitely a, you know there, there were similarities in our background but mine was definitely far more working class than his his was a lot more intellectual as far as his parents went was it a record that you bonded over or no yeah and why he heard me singing to a blue oyster cult song which, that's right that's what he said i remember oh, him saying that right, yeah. yeah blue oyster cult the last days of may by blue oyster cult he heard me singing he was looking for a singer for his band at the time so that's when when he asked if i'd be interested is there still the sense and has there always been a sense that the music you make is a sort of therapy oh without question yeah without question that was the issue i was having with this album prior to us redoing it and and it ending up the way it is, um, was that it wasn't therapy for me. It just sounded like it didn't really mean much. Um, Because you're obviously comfortable enough with each other to talk to each other, to say to each other the things you would say to a therapist. Whereas if you're talking to some pop songwriter, (laughs) that's stuff that you wouldn't necessarily want them to know. know. No, and also these songwriters who do it, you know, for a living, as I'm sure you know, um, it's really kind of formulaic. They write to a certain formula and um, it, it doesn't really need to mean much to them. I mean, yeah, but what they're really saying is what side do you dress, sir? Yeah. Is really what they're saying. Exactly. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, hold on. I dress to the left, apparently. Um, <laughs> Thank you for that. You're welcome. 
so, so it wasn't it wasn't therapy. You know, that the, I think that was the issue. I, I think mm. that I felt that he owed yeah. no real meaning until no small thing came along, and then we started writing more and and redoing the old a few of the older songs. Then it started to take on some meaning for me. And, and I think if there's no meaning in the music, then I, I don't. I don't understand why I would want to do it. That's really interesting. It's like it's it's not real until you're actually getting something out there. Well, unless you're getting something you back, to... you know. I think. Right, I mean, right. For me, if I listen to an album when I've finished it and I'm getting something back and it, it makes me smile or it makes me cry or it makes me go, "That's really good. I love the production on that." Or, you know, unless I get something from it it's a pointless exercise, you know? I mean, I think that, I think there are people that can go in and make an album to a formula and don't really care that much. They just care how many it sells or whether it can fit in on radio or TV or whatever. And that's not what music means to me. It's kind of out there that both of you struggle a bit with each other on the road, Mm -hmm. you know, that that's, if you've had any hard times together, it tends to be on the road. Does that make you nervous about taking this record out? Not really, you know. If it happens, it, it happens. I, I, <laughs> it's part of the I, juice. <laughs> do it while we're still in the pandemic, because then you just, both just have to stay locked in your rooms anyway. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean I think we're at a point, you know, having now finished this album. I mean I think you know the last few tours have been difficult because we hadn't really bonded over anything. We we've definitely bonded over this album. So in that sense, we're sort of more on the same page now than we we would have been otherwise. Mm. So I think that will make it easier. And also, as I said, the older we kind of get, the more comfortable, weirdly, we are if we butt heads. We don't take it as personally as we used to. Um, so we're, we're, we're far more adept at sort of taking a step away and going, eh, maybe I was being a bit of an asshole, and kind of, you know, smoothing yeah. it all over. But yeah. I don't know. I mean, only going on the road will tell us. And you're going, right? You're going out on the road with us. The plan is... Yeah, we, we start um, in May, yeah. Fantastic. Well, brilliant. Well, we'll look forward Where to that. Where are you playing in London, my hometown? Uh, yeah. um, I think we're playing outside of London. And it was a hard one booking shows next year because so many shows, obviously, this year and last year were cancelled that everyone and their dog is playing. So I think we're playing, I think, like Hatfield House or somewhere. And also we're trying to make most of them outdoor shows yeah. because, you know, we don't really know where the pandemic is going. <clears throat> so yeah. um, I think pretty much all of the US dates and UK dates are outdoor shows. Well, listen, I mean, I'm knocked out by you as a live band. You you played, we played with you. We did a double header down in Australia about 12 years ago and you were amazing. I mean, so great. And I know it's got better and better over the years. So really looking forward to hearing this this record live. The good thing about playing live now will be that we get to add some new music finally. You know, obviously we have enough songs to change the set around, but there is a finite amount. Um, so there's only so much you can change. But now we have you know, new material to add to the set. So that's going to be refreshing. That's going to make it all the more enjoyable mm. for us, mm. I think. Mm. Well, it's quite funny because we're in a band which does have an absolutely limited <laughs> amount of material, which we have to kind of juggle around and... Yeah. <laughs> dig deep to find new ways yeah it's it's never you know you find new ways of playing old songs which you know also can be fun i mean they can be fun yeah yeah but um but again still limited so um and and obviously you can't not play those songs either you know you can't go and do a show and not play mad world or not play everybody wants to rule the world so trying to fit in the new material would be interesting. But, you know, if you listen to the album and, and you know, especially a track like No Small Thing, how much fun is that going to be to play live? I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's going to be great. Absolutely. I mean, I can't wait. Yeah, Kurt, it's been great having you on. Brilliant. Thank yeah. you. Really, really Thank lovely you. talking to you. Mate. And your bookcase. And my bookcase. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. oh, absolutely. No, absolutely, total yeah. pleasure talking to you. Such a thoughtful man. Yeah. Really a great new album and wishing you a lot of luck with it. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. It's been a blast. What a nice man. What a nice man. He's very nice, isn't he? He could, he could be my yeah. therapist. I'd trust him. I'd tell him anything. Exactly. You know? They're very deep boys, Tears for Fears. And, and, and I think that's given us some great music, isn't it? Their deepness, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. Or depth. You know, Actually, I think it's depth, a word you're you. looking for, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you know, you, we have some people on the show, don't we? And they want to tell you about, you know, the, the hotel rooms they trashed or, the, you know, the guitars they played or whatever. But both with Kurt and, and Roland, 
They're very different stories. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to go away and sort of, I feel the need for a sort of quiet evening of introspection. Really? Okay. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll leave you to that. Please don't text me with any sort of, you know, I'll be screams crying. or I'll something. I'll be sobbing. Yeah, I'll be yeah. Te- up like sobbing, texting you. And who we got on next week? We don't know yet, do we? We don't know. We never tell them. We don't. We tell. never tell them. Never tell. No. Never explain. Never. Never apologise. Yeah. So <laughs> um, we'll see you then. Thank you for listening. Uh, download. Uh, what do you call it? What do you call subscribe, it? You subscribe. Subscribe. Thank down, you. Please yeah, keep yeah. subscribing if this is the first time you've heard this podcast, because we've got some good stuff on here. Yeah. Oh yes, we have. And uh, so it's good night from me. And it's good night from them. <laughs> <laughs>